All right. I am super, super, super excited for this interview today. And I don't know why I never interviewed you before, Denise. I mean, I... Well, because we're so busy just talking. Like, just... I know. So we should have just recorded our all the many conversations we've had in the past. And exactly. Called it a podcast. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I am super, super, super excited um, to have my very, very, very dear friend, my soul sister, Denise Solar Cox on the podcast and live on LinkedIn today um, to talk about her story. And I mean, her story is so inspirational and you're going to hear so many good things. And I hope that she remembers some of the things that we talked about (laughs) before I hit the record button, but I'm sure she will. But Denise, in case you don't know Denise, Denise is a, she's an amazing person. She is an an author. She is a speaker. She is a mentor. She is a filmmaker, not just one, but two films, which we are going to talk about. She is a TED Talk speaker. She's a wife. She's a mom. And she is an amazing friend. So thank you, Denise, so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Teresa. I'm super excited about what we're going to get into. I know it's going to be juicy. (laughs) Well, it is. All of our conversations are. (laughs) So tell us a little bit about, you know, who you are and a little bit about what you do. And uh, so everybody gets to know you. Yeah. So your, um, your description is, is I would say perfect. And if everyone is, if anyone listening is like, huh, but where did it all start? It all started with an idea for a movie that I had when I was 26 years old. And uh, I was out at a bar with a bunch of friends and I and I got this idea. And it was one of those ideas that, you know, when people say the idea didn't leave me alone, that was the quality around that idea. And I really grappled with, um, I grappled with what I call my enoughness. Like, am I, am I good enough to do this? I don't know anything about that. You know, all the considerations that we have around doing something or achieving something that we feel like is bigger than us uh, are are the same exact things that I grappled with. And that actually went on for 17 years until Mm -hmm. one day I woke up and said, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore. Like, uh, like today is the day that I'm going to change that. I still don't know how, but I made the mental decision to make a change. And um, actually, two years later, uh, we released the film. And uh, so the film is really uh, at the base, and it's kind of the foundation for all the work that I do. Uh, it gave me a chance to become a speaker. Uh, it gave me a chance to write a curriculum for middle school students and become an author. It gave me a chance to write the, um, a book of essays that I'm actually working on right now. And then, um, and then to be a coach and a mentor, and then also to, um, let's see, oh yeah, to make another film. This isn't something that I thought would go on. I just needed, needed to make the film that I made. And what I didn't realize was how much fun I would have and how filmmaking would check so many boxes for me. I was so busy being afraid of becoming a filmmaker and becoming a failure potentially that I didn't realize that if it worked out, um, that I would be so f- fulfilled in a way that I didn't know was possible, meaning like the creative part of me would uh, come alive in a way that had never come alive before professionally. So um, so I'm very happy and excited to share too that I'm working on my second film. So um, mm. uh, that would be it in a nutshell. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about, because you weren't always an entrepreneur. So right. what did you do before you became an entrepreneur and what made you, I mean, I'm guessing what made you decide to become an entrepreneur was the, um, the idea to have to make a film, but I think there was something else that happened prior to that. So oh, yeah. tell us a little bit, tell us a little bit about like, what did you do before you, what did you do before you owned Project Denya, which is the name of yeah, your business? So, yeah. The, um, so before that, I mean, I came out of college and I was a graphic designer and it's one of those things like. I went to college, I thought I wanted to go into advertising, which is interesting because advertising is really like professional storytelling, right? With video and still images, photography and stuff like that, which is 
what I very much do now. I, in many ways, consider myself a professional storyteller. So part of me knew, and I was gravitating towards this world. I just didn't know um, like where where it all fit, and I didn't need to. You know, I just needed to do the next thing, which was uh, having an opportunity to work at a newspaper. <laughs> And, uh, and be a graphic yeah. designer. And, um, and then I really loved it. The only problem with graphic design is it's very solitary. And I would call myself, a, you know, not an extreme extrovert, but on a scale of one to 10, I'm probably like a 9.5 when it comes to extroverts. <laughs> so like, I don't like no. being alone. <laughs> I know my preference, you know, is to be with other people. Now I do have to like those people, but like my preference <laughs> is to be with others and I don't do well by myself and so that was like a conflict being a graphic designer but I did love creating um, mm -hmm. and then I thought I wanted to be a teacher because there was a part of me also that wanted to make a difference and give back and so I actually went back for my master's in uh, education which I don't even know if you know that but no I, I don't from, yeah 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 so I, I was a graphic designer by day a freelance graphic designer by day which is sort of entrepreneurial right it is entrepreneurial had clients mm -hmm. and everything and then uh and then at night i was taking classes and i was also waiting tables to put myself through this program well halfway through i i saw how much i was going to make as a teacher in miami florida which i lived where i lived at the time and i was like there's no way and don't ask me why i didn't find this out before I'll just call it immaturity. <laughs> I'll just file that under immaturity because this will never happen. This would never happen right now, right? Uh, but in any case, I I ended the pro or I stopped the program halfway through because I'm like I can't I can't afford to be a teacher in the conventional uh, way. And then I ended up going on um, setting um, that kind of set the course on on a different uh, route because I knew I wanted to be creative. And I knew I wanted to make a difference in the world. So at that point is when I started trying out different entrepreneurial ventures and actually ended up in network marketing, which a lot of people are cringing right now. And a lot of people are like, oh, I get what she's saying. <laughs> so cringing because, you know, like, yeah, I, I annoyed my family and friends wanting them to join my business, which is like the hardest part of being in network marketing. And the one thing that I wish would change about it, right? Uh, but, where, but where I found like that creativity, the making the difference, there's a lot of uh, self-improvement and a lot of training and personal training and development in those in those companies. And I really thrived there. And so actually, that's what I was doing and doing well, I might add, um, before I decided to take the leap into making this film. And um, and so, yeah. And so that kind of fulfilled the personal development and then teaching because I had I had risen the, to the to the ranks of people inviting me to lead calls or lead trainings or lead meetings and what have you. And uh, and I was loving both of them. But it wasn't until I actually got down and dirty starting making the film that I was like, whoa, this is beyond um, satisfying, gratifying and fulfilling. Yeah, but it took a minute to get there. Yeah. And, and most of the I mean. Most of the time it does because we, you know, we hold ourselves back and we think, oh, like, you know, I can't, I can't go, I can't do that right now. Or I can't, you know, maybe I'm not good enough. And so let's kind of, cause you do talk and you teach people that they are enough. They're more than enough. That is one of the big things that you teach. And I know that you've had to come through a lot to get to that point. So let's talk about like some of the challenges and things that you faced on this journey. I mean, one of the things, and correct me if I'm wrong, I might've wrote it down wrong, <laughs> but you <laughs> had said to me that you thought you were ready way before you were ready, or maybe yeah. it was reversed. Well, so that, and that, so the whole being, um, so after I, you know, I began working on the film and the film came out, I, I also have the beautiful quality that a lot of entrepreneurs have which I'm gonna say is it's like a double-edged sword or like a, one of those things that has two sides, front of the hand, back of the hand, however you wanna look at it. Um, I am extraordinarily impatient and I've had to like manage my impatience and like learn how to temper that impatience. And, um, and so that's been very good for me because when I lock in on something, I want it yesterday, right? Which can be extraordinarily annoying for anyone that has worked for me. And I feel like I've <laughs> hopefully worked that out. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, <laughs> after all this time, right? Because I, when I first started, I was like, yeah, no, no, yesterday. Now I'm just like, huh, okay, I think we could wait on this. 
Uh, but in any case, um, I'm talking about like results. Like I'm talking about like, man, I should be asked to, you know, when I started becoming, um, when I, when I started being invited to speak at places, I wanted to be on the biggest stages. I wanted to be invited for the highest paying gigs. Right. And so I would apply for certain things and I wouldn't get them. And I just had this experience of just, um, feeling like doors were shutting on me. Uh, but in hindsight now, I realized I just wasn't ready. And I really like those no's were a gift, even though they made me feel angsty and triggered my not good enough. And even though I felt like, am I ever, am I ever, is this ever really going to work out for me? Am I ever going to be on the stages that I feel that I should be on? Um, and now that I'm kind of on those stages or invited to be on those stages now, I look back and think that, that, per, that version of me was absolutely not as ready as the one that I am today. And it's because of, you know, wisdom and time and experience working uh, and delving into such such a narrow field as I would say the Latino market is, you know, mm -hmm. and especially like the even narrower field of first gen Latinos and then um, and then broadly belonging. And so um, understanding the relationship that my experience with this slice of the Latino community, and then what that taught me about belonging um, has gotten me here where I am today. No, I mean, just no way was I able to, um, to, to be able to reflect on it and to even teach or make any kind of difference without all the time and experience in between that very impatient version of me and the version that I am today. I hope that made sense. So oh my gosh. Absolutely. absolutely. You know, and it's funny because I always like get so frustrated with myself because I don't, you know, I'm a business consultant, but I don't have a master's degree. But what I do have is a ton of experience, real life experience. And I remember, I remember you saying to me a long time ago when I first met you that it doesn't matter about the degree. What matters is the experiences that you've been through and what you've done with it so that you can share them. That was mm -hmm. one of the big things that you said to me. And I know that, and we're going to dig a little bit more into the experiences that you've been through and how that relates to the film that you, the, the first film that you made, and also, you know, these projects that you're working on now, as well as your work in Project Enya. I mean, you've had program online programs, you've had a membership, but I want, before we go there, I want to talk about, because as you're talking, and even though you're not Italian, and I'm not Italian either, but <laughs> we talk with our hands, although most right. people think I am, but I'm not. You have a beautiful <laughs> ring on, so Aww. let's let's talk about let's talk about your wedding ring because your wedding ring is has a huge. I mean, besides the fact that you're married to an amazing man, um, Aww, and you. Uh, you know your wedding ring has significance way beyond just you know, marrying an amazing man. There's, there's much more to it. So why don't you talk a little bit about that and how it relates to your journey? Yeah. So back, I'm trying to think like when this exactly happened, it, I, it was probably seven years ago. So things got started eight years ago, but it was probably seven years ago that, um, that I realized <laughs> one day, uh, that we weren't going to be able to pay our our bills the following month. Also something I'm going to file under immaturity for not being able to like forecast that, but that's, you know, that's, we all do truth, it. Right? Yeah. It's like, wow, we're not going to be able to pay our rent. Oh my gosh, this is crazy. You know? And, uh, and so I, like I said, I was pretty successful in my network marketing business. And so I was just used to getting paid every month and, um, and that, and, the less attention I paid to that business, the less money I would make. But it was kind of going down slowly. It happened like a slow drip, not fast. So it was very like, um, almost felt like all of a sudden. But regardless, I found myself in this moment where we weren't gonna be able to pay our bills. And I had already um, been doing, you know, been working on the film for a year and was super steeped in the world and realizing, uh, and and just felt so locked and loaded like and i think everyone knows that feeling like when you know you're in the right place at the right time with the right people it just you just know it and it's mm. very difficult to describe beyond that right but i knew this was the thing 
I had to be doing and wanted to be doing, and I didn't want anything to change. And so I started getting resourceful and thinking about what could we sell, honestly, like what could we sell? What's, what's around this place uh, that we could sell and looked at my hand and thought, oh my gosh, like if, if we sold these rings, if my husband, who I call the gringo cowboy, uh, he has his own hashtag. Um, if he we does. Sold these rings, <laughs> so it's because he's from Oklahoma and I'm from New York. Totally different story. But anyway, um, <laughs> if we sold these rings, uh, this would easily pay for what we owe and then some, right? We even have a cushion. So um, I asked him what he thought of that. And of course, it was a difficult decision. A lot of people ask me, but like, how could you like a lot of people say, like, I just can't believe you arrived there. Like, I just can't believe you actually went ahead and did it. Because I think sometimes people think, oh, well, I, you know, if, if worse came to worse, I would just do this, this and this. But I think a lot of people uh, either their back hasn't been up against the wall. Right. Or they would or they might interpret what I interpreted. My back against the wall might be different than how someone else would interpret it. But for me, I felt. Um, like I was locked and loaded, not only with how I felt, but also with my purpose. And mm -hmm. when you get that feeling, when you know, this is what I was born to do. I was born for this. Everything in my past makes sense uh, because uh, now that I'm here and I must fulfill on it. Like it just was, it was a burn the boats moment. And I, I had already burned the boats. So I was going to figure it out no matter mm -hmm. what. And so that's what we did. We sold the rings. And that day, my husband and I made a promise to each other that we would not tell a soul. And the reason why was because I was deeply, deeply embarrassed and ashamed that it had come to that. And I knew that there would be judgments. And at that time, I just wasn't willing to, um, I didn't feel, I didn't feel ready to be on the other end of someone's judgment, you know? And, um, and so like, we didn't say anything. We didn't say anything until one night, my uh, until the night before we screened the film actually in New York City. And my partner and I, um, my my creative partner, Henry and I were walking down the sidewalk and I was I was terrified that the film we had made that we were going to screen the following night would just be a disaster. And that all of these sacrifices that I'd made, um, not only not only my ring, but there were other financial sacrifices I'd made as well um, would be for naught. And, uh, and, and he didn't know about him because I prom you know, my husband and I promised not to tell anybody, but on the sidewalk that night, I said, you don't know what I sacrificed. If it doesn't work out tomorrow night, like I don't have a wedding ring. I don't have a car. I don't have all of these things. And he was like, Whoa, what? <laughs> and I ended up telling him like, I like, it. I always love that rings and blah, blah, blah. And then, so now if you watch the film, there's actually this scene. It was the last scene that was put in the film and it's me sharing how we sold the rings but that scene was not originally it wasn't in the film and it certainly wasn't in the film that people saw the next night and um and so yeah so and of course uh thank god knock on wood the film did very well and has continued to do well for the last six years which is just beyond any anything i can imagine and um a lot of times people ask me like why my husband and I haven't gotten rings again and uh and I always say because I'd rather go on vacation because of this because of that right um and uh and recently um we were actually more financially ready to buy the rings but I couldn't decide what I wanted and so I just trusted that a ring would appear that would speak to me and that's how I would know. And then that, those would be the rings that I would get. And then he could of course pick anyone he wanted. And so that's what happened. I was literally scrolling Instagram and I saw a picture of a ring and I was like, ah, oh, that's my ring. That's the ring. And oh so we God. went and uh, found a jeweler locally, showed her the picture and she made, um, and she made the ring. And then we literally just picked them up. It was last mm -hmm. week, right? Last yeah. Week, so. Yeah. Last week. Uh, and it was very, um, very, uh, it was a very momentous moment for us. And the one thing, if I have to say, there's so many lessons, but a lot of times people, they just can't imagine um, selling like the symbol of, of a marriage, right? Like that's what it is. It's like the symbol of a marriage. And for me, um, what I realized was that a, a ring doesn't a beautiful marriage make. Like that, yeah. that beautifulness, that, um, and this makes me emotional, but like that specialness, that, um, 
devotion and commitment yeah. to another human being that happens between two people. Yeah. And the ring is a symbol of that. But the actual relationship is like in the, it's in the eternal, it's in the, you know, no, it's in that, it's in the space between two human beings that love and care for each other. And so that was a beautiful gift I got. And so when we put those rings back on, I, I just told my husband, thank you so much for trusting me, you know, mm -hmm. because it, the new rings became a symbol of devotion and yeah. commitment beyond anything. I think he was ready to commit to the day we got married. <laughs> yeah. You know? But that's, I mean, that is a sign of, I mean, and I, I know Kevin and Kevin is just, I mean, he's funny, he's smart, but he's also extremely, extremely supportive. And mm. I mean, you're right. And I think my husband has said the same thing. Like, I mean, we waited 13 years before we got married. And, um, right. you know, yeah, he always says like, wow, like I got more than I thought I was going to get since I was <laughs> an entrepreneur with all of these, mm. you know, ups and downs and things that happen. But it's, it's true. It's the, the ring is just the symbol of it, but it's not it. And I think, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, like what happened with you and what you guys were able to do and, you know, what it took to get there. I think there's not very many people that would do that. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's what makes you so special you know, but also what you said is when you believe and you know, you have a purpose in your heart and that purpose isn't there by accident. There is a divine, whatever you believe in God, the universe, you know, source, you know, whatever butterflies and whatever, like that, that's who put that in your heart. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. not there. And most people won't, it's not there by accident. Most people won't tap into that and say, you know what, like, let me listen to this. Let me listen uh -huh. to, you know, what I'm being called to do. Someone I heard one time, like God doesn't call, I'm going to get it wrong. God, Jamie, Jamie, Lee, Jamie, um, Jamie Kern Lima. I had to look at her, her name. Oh, I, I love her. I love yeah. that book. Oh my gosh. I was a mess reading she, that book. She says, she said, God doesn't call the chosen. He chooses the called or something like that something like that. And it's like, uh -huh. like what you just said, it's kind of the same. I mean, it's, it's a full embodiment of it. And you really, when you have that purpose in your heart and you know, like I am meant to do this, you got to go all in. And more often than not, you're going to have more challenges and more struggles and things than you are the good stuff, but it makes the good stuff even better. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. So true. Yeah. So you, let's talk about your film because there's so, oh my gosh, there's so much in your film and I've watched your film many times over. Um, but that was kind of like that catapult to go to the next level. Um, mm -hmm. and like make that dream that you had in your heart and all those sacrifices really like, you know, like worth it. So let's talk, yeah. uh, let's talk about your film. Cause like I said, there's so much in there and I'm getting like chills on my right leg. So, <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> so the film, so the film was inspired by a night at a bar with some friends. That's how everybody should know that. And the, there was actually a reenactment scene that we did about that night. And it kind of just shows how fun we were trying to capture how fun it is when you're with your friends and eating good food and drinking, you know, wine and what have you. Um, but what happened that night was up until then, up until 26, I really believed that my lived experience feeling alone around my identity, feeling alone around not feeling Latina enough, I'm Puerto Rican, not feeling Puerto Rican enough and not feeling American enough was literally my own journey. Uh, I did not grow up with YouTube. The internet was not a thing. And so like, I couldn't Google this. So there was, you know, there, there was probably books about it or that touched on it, but nothing um, available outside actually the breadth of books that actually did read. There's some really, really well-known books by Sandra Cisneros, Cisneros, Julia Alvarez, Esmeralda Santiago that touched on these things and I read them all and I still felt very alone. And um, while I was there with my friends, uh, I realized that I wasn't alone. 
And it was just this moment that happened. And I, I can hardly describe it except for to say we were all reflecting on what it was like to have parents from another country. And we were mm -hmm. kind of making fun of their accents. We were making fun of different, just the way that they are and the way that we were and the way that how different it is to be first gen. And no one was even saying first gen then. Okay. It was just like, we were just kind of sharing about this experience that I literally believed was my own. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I'm not alone. But the most important part of the story is, is that I literally believed that I was mm -hmm. and, and I acted like I was. And so I lived my life like I was. And in mm -hmm. a split second, I realized I'm not alone. Oh my gosh. Like imagine um, feeling and experiencing life not being able to talk about something because you just plain don't think no one's going to get it or understand you to all of a sudden realizing this is a shared experience. What? Right. And like yeah. everything turned upside down, but like for the best reasons possible. And instead of feeling disconnected around my identity, my ethnic identity, you know, it's a really, really cathartic thing to go from no one gets me to, if I just share most people, um, will realize i'll realize how similar i am to them it's kind of bananas right and so it was so profound for me that i literally busted out the the cocktail napkins very like stereotypical you know beginning of a business kind of moment but for me it was i didn't want to forget what all these people were saying and i shoved them in my purse i started driving or you know we said good night i had already had the idea i'm going to make a movie about this don't ask me how that came into my head i literally I believe that was a divine intervention. Like yeah. I do, like it was just like, let me just plant this idea in her head and see what happens. And I also know other people had the same idea because I've met them at my screenings. Oh my God, I had the same idea to do the exact same thing, but I didn't do it because of dot, 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 right? Like how, how did you do it? And a lot of times I say, I really don't know, except for I made a decision, but I would, right? And we all know I sold my wedding rings, but selling my wedding rings wasn't a how it was it was a means to an end right yeah. and so it was more of a decision as we all know but this is like the real life version so i left the restaurant knowing i'm going to make a movie and mind you i was a freelance graphic designer at the time getting my masters in english or in, in education this was beyond anything that i believed or had planned for myself or believed was possible but yet i knew that it was the trajectory of my life yeah. So I get in my car and I'm driving down 95 South to Coconut Grove, where I lived for seven years. And um, like that whole devil angel thing started happening, you know, like, oh my gosh, I felt so free. And the angel was like, I always say the angel's like your best friends. And so you're like the angel in my life, Teresa, like, <laughs> you can do it, movie. Who cares if you don't have experience? It'll be amazing because you're amazing, right? So like <laughs> we need lots of angels in our lives. And when we have those angels, we keep we need to keep those close. So the angel was like, yes. But then the devil was like, are you kidding me? You don't have any experience. You don't have any training. You didn't even go to school for this, right? Like you, and you can't even speak Spanish perfectly fluently. Like you're actually like a terrible person to make this movie. And then my joke is if you're Latino, you also have your mother who's showing up somewhere there saying, I didn't send you to college for this. And oh my gosh, what are you thinking, right? <laughs> So by the time my mother said that, was like, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not just Latino mothers. So um, anyway, it um, by the time I got home, I convinced myself I wasn't the right person, and which is terrible, right? Like it literally mm -hmm. took like a a thirty forty minute drive um, for me to change my mind. But what happened was it kept coming back into my life. It kept just ping ponging back, and when I saw films. Um, when I saw, when I had conversations, when I started conversations, I just kept feeling, uh, it just became alive again, even for a moment. And, um, and I just had so many of those moments that I just couldn't stand not doing it. And, um, I don't even know where are we in this conversation, but, um, <laughs> you're good. You're talking about the I film. Answer your question? <laughs> about the oh yeah. So the film. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So then when we got started on the film, I wasn't thinking I was going to share anything about my life. This was not the purpose. The purpose wasn't to talk about me because I still believed I wasn't my life and lived experience was the best version to show. I really sincerely believed that I wanted it to be about other people. Um, mm -hmm. But then as we kind of went on, I 
did a bunch of interviews. My creative partner, who is an Oscar nominated documentary, who's made, you know, a bunch of films. And, uh, and I would cut, so I would call him the expert in storytelling, right? Uh, he thought, you know what, I think that we need to center you in this film and center your story. And I was like, hell no, like, I'm not doing that. First of all, I don't want anyone to know my story. Second of all, bad idea. <laughs> right. And so, but he just kept pushing and pushing. And finally, I just surrendered to that. And so uh, for, for those who are listening, you will learn part of my story. And the reason why that's relevant is because I had to, two things about this that I want to share. One is I had to agree that share by sharing my story it could make a difference in another person's life and I think a lot of people grapple with that and they're like well my mm -hmm. no one cares about me or I haven't been through anything or I don't have anything uh uniquely to share that maybe hasn't been shared before all of that is actually bs right yeah. like we all actually all of our individual journeys could literally transform lives and uh, and the only reason why I know this is because that's what people have told me. But before this, I was, I, I, I was not a believer in that. I really believed, I, I believed at the time that only certain people have amazing stories and those stories are the ones that should be told. But my story was not classified as one of those stories. I, I, I wouldn't evaluate other people. I would only just evaluate myself, right? right? And so that's the first thing. And the second thing is I chose to leave some things out. So here I had this opportunity to share my life story. And there were certain things that I made taboo. There were certain things that I was like, I will absolutely not cross this line. I will absolutely not share these things, even though those things were some of the biggest things that had ever happened to me. Things that I didn't believe at the time were relevant or important. Um, and then some of them I would classify as under lock and key and never to be shared with anyone ever. Mm -hmm. But what happened was when the film came out, being Enya, that's the first film, um, people would share with me secrets really really profound um secrets secrets that maybe they hadn't even told a single person before they told me right after the screening of the film and they were secrets in the same variety and classification as the ones that i didn't want to share right so i realized wow maybe it wasn't a good idea for me not to share because clearly people want to share these things this film is giving people a sense of safety. It's giving them a sense of freedom to want to be candid about something that they've either not been candid about more than one person before, or that they're just plain old ready to be free of, right? Like right. secrets that we've just held for a lifetime that we're just ready to be done with it. Like, I just want you to know this, right? So um, after this happened about, no kidding, about 50 times, because before the pandemic, um, I did roughly 150 dates uh, over the course of three years. And at about 50, I was uh, convinced that there was something here and that I was being given another, um, I don't know, appointment or assignment. And that was make a movie about secret keeping, make a yeah. movie about what holds people back, um, make a movie to help the people that feel bound um, and restrained and like, like they don't experience their own agency, right? Make a movie for them to help um, jostle them loose from this uh, sense that they can't be free because of this horrible thing that might have happened to them in their life and because they don't feel comfortable enough to share it. And so that's what I've been working on. Um, and that's the the topic of my next film and uh, and also my upcoming book what is um what is the so the first film was called being enya um yes. and what is just so people know what is the term enya what does that mean yeah so the and the the term has kind of evolved over time and i will say the term was not mine i had heard it on the radio in miami many many years ago actually in my late 20s and i was like <gasps> Oh my gosh, I'm an Enya. And so Enya just means the generation of, of people who are born here in the United States who have at least one parent from a Spanish speaking country. So we are Americans and we also very much feel like 
we are also from another country, even though we weren't born in that country. And we actually experience this yearning and nostalgia for a place that was never like, quote unquote, ours, right? But that we feel an ownership with. Now, right. it has evolved into including uh, people that were brought here at a young age. And then finally, anyone that identifies with it can own that term because what it has come to signify is this push pull of identity. And there's actually a saying in Spanish, ni de aquí, ni de allá. It means I'm not from here and I'm not from there. And so this mm. Enya really um, embodies that experience. Wow. Wow. And I know that um, in the film, and we're going to put this in the show notes and in the comments below so people can go to your website and, you know, um, do what they have to do so that they can watch the film. Um, but they, um, in the film, I know you talk a lot about your story and, you know, what you went through. I mean, you lost two very, very important people in your life, um, your brother and your father. And you talk about mm -hmm. that in the film, um, as well as number one, how that impacted you, but it impacted you even more because those were the people that because of what you went through, you know, being in an area where you weren't accepted, those were the two people that really helped you to feel accepted and to, mm -hmm. you know, watch out for you. And so there's a lot in the movie that you telling your story is so, and I've been to your events where people have come up to you and have mm -hmm. said, I mean, thank you so much. And then they have gone on to share their story um, and how you and the film and what they got from it, but how that helped them to unlock something that was has been locked for so long. And I think, wow. as you said, moving into your next film, that is that whole when we don't crack open and break open who we are and break open, you know, when we when we you know, hold on to that old story or we hold on to all that old hurt or we hold on to all of that stuff and we don't like either talk about it or let it out or let it go, um, we stay stuck. And I know, you know, I, I mean, you know, my um, business partner and best friend, she passed away last year. And I know I talk a lot about how a part of me died when she died, but also mm -hmm. a part of me broke wide open um, you know, after that, at that part that I was trying to push down and hold back and, and she was always trying to encourage me to get it out there. And I think mm -hmm. that, um, that is definitely like the work that you do is it gets people to, it, they have, a, it's like a tran like a transformation, you know, where they can go from being afraid to be them to being so proud of being them and stepping in and owning that. And I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you watch being in you, you love, like you just can't help but fall in love with every single person in that film. And then just the film itself, I mean, the way that it was done with like you telling your story and then it would, it would flip to like somebody speaking and like talking about something. And then it would, like it was just so phenomenal. <laughs> so Thank um, you. Thanks so, so much. Yeah. So I'm definitely, I mean, I'm excited. When is your new, what is your new film going to be called? We have not that? released the name. I'm, I'll tell you offline. Uh, but we have not released the name publicly yet. So, uh, and it's actually the same, the book will be the name, the name, or this is what we think now. Uh, it'll be the same name as my book. So, um, and it'll be book and then movie that come out. And so I, we're actually in an interesting situation right now because we're looking at the book coming out next summer. And so the film needs to come out after the book. So mm -hmm. who knew that in the, in the releasing in the book world, which the book kind of opportunity came to me very unexpectedly um, and how how the best way to kind of release something is to have the book come out first and have a bunch of people read it and then uh, have the, the film kind of version of the book, which is always, you know, an inter interpretation, especially in a nonfiction situation, you know, yeah. so uh, 
So yeah. anyway, yeah, so it's very exciting. So it, I, my hope is that the that the movie will come out next year, but I'm not 100% sure now because the book needs to be out first. So stay tuned, everybody. And if you're not following yes. Denise on social media, you need to follow her at Project Enya. All right. Little, Yay. little like preview to what's coming. <laughs> so tell me, tell me, um, you know, because one of the things that you talk about, um, and that you teach people is the whole belonging, that whole, you know, like whether they are, you know, in a corporate environment and how people can help the Latino culture and really anybody for that matter. Yeah. Um, yeah. to feel a sense of belonging in a corporate culture, but also, you know, in their everyday life. What does belonging, what, it, what does belonging mean to you? And what do you do to help people to feel like they belong? Yeah. Th thanks for asking about that because it's, it's such an interesting thing. So after, like I said, be, before the pandemic, uh, I did about 150 uh, live in-person engagements. And one thing, aside from the secret thing that became abundantly clear, there was something else that was happening as well. And so there would always be some kind of um, a gathering, you know, a small, a smaller gathering that would happen at a lunch or a dinner or what have you, breakfast, let's say after an event or the day after. And uh, and it would be like people would want to like talk about identity, even like just nerd out on identity. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's so funny because I, I like nerd out about this and uh, and I love other people who love to talk about this. And so I, I love being in these conversations. And there was something that was happening in each one of these conversations, which it would sort of end like it would always end in the same place. Right. No matter how, all, no matter all the different ways we explored and, and then went deep in the exploration of those things, it always ended uh in a discussion about belonging. It's like, that's where all of these things ended up. Like with, um, like think about two films. Um, the most recent was, uh, ah, what was it? The um, Crazy Rich Asians, right? No, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the one, like, who doesn't love that movie? Right. I mean, like you can see it now. It's on Southwest like permanently as a movie that you can watch <laughs> when you're flying because it's such a good movie that a lot yeah. of people like. And uh, <laughs> same thing with my big fat Greek wedding. Remember mm. when that came out and mm. like, you didn't have to be Greek. Like you got it. It was for everybody. Now, if you were Greek, did you think it was for you? Yes. It was a love letter to Greek people who are Americans or the Greek diaspora, right? That's the work that I do is really for um, the Latino diaspora, meaning the Latinos that are not live, currently living in the original country that their parents, grandparents or what have you are from. Um, so those people that are, are living away from the homeland, um, crazy rich Asians was also the same thing. Do you have to be Asian to love that movie? No. Mm -hmm. But if you were from the, the countries that this, that the people were from, that the characters were from, you probably thought, oh my gosh, this is a love letter to us. Right now. The beautiful thing about those two films is that all, even though they were about very specific things, they were also about very general things. Right. And so even though my work is about identity in the Latino diaspora, it's really about belonging, which is something that everyone can participate in, which is mm -hmm. something that everybody gets. It's a human experience um, when someone experiences belonging or when they don't, when it's like this absence of belonging. And so being in these conversations, I started being able to understand, like, what are the what is like the foundational elements, like when belonging is present? Um, what are the feelings around that? What what creates belonging? Because for whatever reason, when people would screen my film, belonging was present, right? And yeah. so I wanted to understand that more. And um, and so I began to began to over time, right? Began to understand what the elements were, like how could one create belonging aside from put, playing my movie? Like what what would need to be there? And one of the things that needs to be there is to understand from, from what ideological uh, lens you look at the world from. And not to, this is not nerdy. This is actually going to be very interesting. So everyone that's from a Spanish-speaking country and actually an Asian and African country mm. um, looks at the world through what's called collectivism. It's an ideological uh, 
uh, value system, right? And so we value the group. We, val we, we center the group instead of the individual. So there's a certain hierarchy. There's a deference to elders. Oftentimes we live multi-generationally. Uh, there's a lot of kind of qualities that go with collectivism and being part of a collective culture. Um, here in the United States and in Northern Europe, self-reliance is the dominant uh, ideology. And that centers the single person, that everything revolves around one single person, right? And so there's no judgment. A lot of people are like, ooh, that's bad. Like, especially if you're from collective dominant mindset, oh, what? Centering things around a single person is selfish. And then um, conversely, not thinking about yourself from a self-reliant point of view is uh, is to your detriment, right? And so uh, this conversation is best uh, had without judgment. So we can, yeah. we'll tell the waiter to hold the judgment and just listen to like the conversation. So what I realized was when people knew their dominant ideology, and so anyone here in the United States, um, is probably going to feel some kind of combination of both of those things. Mm. But, there, but there will exist a dominant one, right? And you'll know because like, you know, you could go through this whole set of questions and you'll just realize, oh, wow, yeah, I do think it's, I do think that that's wrong. <laughs> or <laughs> I do think that that's right. And that will put you in uh, one camp or the other as a dominant. It doesn't mean that you can't be a hybrid. Most people are a hybrid here. But how that relates to belonging is if I walk into a room, right, and I read, uh, I don't read as Latina in a stereotypical, uh, I would say, impression. Um, my skin is very light. Um, I don't have an accent, right? So I, I read very ambiguous. Now, I am still Latina and I, I'm still collective dominant. And so when I go into a space, oftentimes professional space, professional spaces tend to be 99.9% .9 self-reliant dominant mm -hmm. and so someone like me will automatically feel uncomfortable and automatically feel like as if i have to do something called code switching which is um putting on a kind of different part of my identity highlighting a different part of my identity which um which uh centers the individual but like which um you know like uh collective people tend to be more expressive Right, and mm -hmm. we don't judge uh, expressiveness uh, negatively. Self-reliant people tend to be more reserved and tend to judge people who are more expressive. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So I'm, I'm totally. Like, another thing that collective-minded people do is we have a different relationship with time. We often look to the past to understand the present. We often look at the past to get centered in the moment. We often look at the past to be grateful for where we are because of what our ancestors have provided for us, right? You can you can begin to think about uh, how people do that online and live. Self-reliance um, tends to not look at the past and tends to tends to have vision for the future, which uh, and so not focusing on any past rights or wrongs but just exclusively looking at how can we do things better in the future or how can we create a future? And so there are all these nuances that kind of come into play. And so when I'm in a self-reliant dominant space, which most, most spaces, especially professional spaces are self-reliant dominant, then I if, I hold, if I talk about vision in the future, right? But, um, but I might be inclined to say, well, let's look at the past and let's look at like, you know, let's center ourselves in something um, first right that that's collective and potentially could be judged like oh they just want to look at the past they're stuck in the past you know like you can start thinking about how these things are judged or like my innate expressiveness we talked about how i'm uh how i'm extremely extroverted right sometimes in some professional spaces the way that i am inherently informed by my ideological dominance is looked down upon as uneducated and the, the the amount of times that I use my hands to express myself, body language experts actually say that someone that uses their hands a lot is a, it's a sign of low intelligence. And so that's actually informed by an ideology. <laughs> that's me. Not the <laughs> truth. Well, it's it, it's interesting, right? And so so my expertise is understanding these norms and teasing them apart from each other so that we can understand from where like ser like where are we coming from this is beyond like you know Myers-Briggs or or these other things that are actually terrific yeah. ways of understanding the stage that is set when we're in professional environments or community environments or familial environments right 
when we understand where we come from, then we can say, oh, wow, I'm, I'm being collective by, and I'm judging you for putting your mother in a, in a nursing home, right? Because collective people, collective dominant people don't put their parents in nursing homes. They move their parents in with them. That's what mm. they do. It's quote unquote wrong to put your parents in a nursing home. Like it's like a sin. It's like a sin level wrongness, right? Uh, but self-reliant dominant is like, we don't have room for mom and dad. You're going over here. I hope you have insurance because we're not, we don't have room for you at our house, <laughs> right? And like that, but that's just how it is. That's yeah. just how it is. And so, and both sides, the, the interesting thing is both sides think they're right. And for, and for the way they see the, the world, they are right. The question is, how, does, how do we create environments where someone feels when they're from the opposite ideal, uh, dominant ideology, how do we make sure that they feel like they belong? And so when we talk about the great resignation, when we talk about um, people, not, people of color specifically not wanting to go back into the work environment, there's a lot more at play than meets the eye. What I'm hearing is I don't want to have to code switch. Code switch is exhausting, and it is exhausting, right? Not being able to use my hands as much having to tone down my big personality so that people respect me is exhausting. It's so much easier to be home and just create results uh, and then provide those results. Not just, but do you know what I'm saying? Versus yeah. having to deal with all this, I would say EQ stuff, right? Um, but eventually we have to be and share spaces with the people. Eventually we have to like confront that there is a self-reliant dominance world out there that's that's calling this is right and this is wrong and a whole bunch of people are left out of the conversation so it it becomes this situation where people just you know when they say i don't feel like i belong or my people aren't there there's not enough they're talking about this and it's invisible hmm. and that's why conversations around belonging really have to begin foundationally at this in this ideological like what's your ideological dominance what's the dominant ideology here in this organization and how are we making space for people from an an, uh, an opposite often collective dominant uh ideology how do we make space for them to feel like um like they belong to and yeah. the fact that it's um uh, ideological opposites presents a ginormous challenge and so that's mm. the, that is um the work that i get to do is to kind of uh sort that out and, and explain that to people Wow. That's phenomenal. I've never heard you, I've heard you talk about belonging, you know, many times, but I've never heard you explain it like that. And that is, um, I mean, that's so interesting and you can see, yeah, like a lot of, you know, when we were talking about this before we got on the call, there's a lot of industries and a lot of businesses that are, you know, functioning from 20, 30, 40 years ago and people are different and the society is different. We're learning, you know, we're, we're progressing, we're learning, we're changing. And there goes my hair. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, uh -huh. you know, we have to change and progress with it. And a lot of people don't. And, you know, culture is the biggest thing that, um, you know, that you need to create in your business. Like you need to create a healthy, wealthy, I like, I always say a diverse culture diverse in thinking, diverse in people, diverse in backgrounds. But you're right. I mean, addressing that belonging, that is so, so key to doing that. And when you're able to do that, you're able to build, build your business. So, yeah, I mean, and also thrive, like see, imagine like what you're saying, um, a, a diverse place of work. So diverse would mean more people that have collective dominance, right? And so we're thinking people of African descent, people of Asian descent, people of uh, Latino descent. So more people like that infused into your business, um, into your self-reliant dominant business can't even help it because that's just how it is over here, right? And so they're going to know how to communicate. It's going to be innate in them. They will know how, especially, you know, how to communicate to potential customers that are just simply not hearing your message right now mm. because you're collective dominant. And you're and and the thing is, it's it's like being an expert in this. It's like I can see the invisible and I can hear the invisible, and it's so it's very easy for me to say like, wow, here's a great example. It's very interesting. Airbnb, just as a case study, Airbnb. I did this um, analysis recently. Airbnb ver, uh, versus uh, VRBO. I say VRBO. Some people say Verbo. Whatever it is, don't get caught up in that. I say VRBO. So. <laughs> uh, 
I analyzed, I watched like every Airbnb commercial that was like I could possibly watch on YouTube. And then I watched every VRBO commercial that I could possibly watch. And I saw something, something became abundantly clear. Airbnb is catering to a self-reliant dominant person. All mm. of their commercials have a single person. All of their commercials is one single person's point of view and experience. Literally, they focus on the individual. Now, if you look at VRBO, their commercials have families. Their commercials have extended families. Their commercials have, it's not just a couple of people. It's many, many people. And they're pulling from the collective ideology and is very intentional what they're doing. And, you know, they do the same thing. Like, oh, I'm going to the mountains. You look up Airbnb, you look up VRBO. Except for, and you might think, oh, these companies are interchangeable. But eventually, there's going to be uh, this, like, this like gravitational pull towards VRBO from collective dominant people. And we're not going to be able to put it into words except for to say they're just like, I just feel like I belong better with VRBO, yeah. right? I just feel like they understand me better or I just like them better. I don't know why I can't explain it, but it's going to be because of this, because of the way the positioning. And so when you think about a business, like, do you want to <laughs> attract just the individual? Or do you want to attract the group? Um, and then by attracting the group, you're also going to be attracting the individual, right? But if you just attract the individual, you will not be attracting the group. So when we think about a business case for adjusting uh, messaging, um, this is it, you know, not to mention, um, you know, being able to retain employees and that whole conversation. Yeah. Wow. That is so, so interesting. Fast. Right? <laughs> That's so fascinating. I'm just like, I mean, in a totally, you know, it's really looking at like human connection, like human beings, like yeah. human, like it's just, and and I always, you know, I'm a firm believer in humanizing business, and that's exactly what it's doing. So, oh my gosh. Oh, this, yeah. this, bleh. I don't I can't even speak. This one. <laughs> and one more thing, one more thing about that is uh, this came up in a resource workshop that I did. And that was like, you know, we're coming off of this pandemic. I think, you know, we all know that most people want to get together. You know, there's, before the pandemic, I think a lot of people were like, oh my gosh, I need a break from the world, right? And, uh, but right now people really are valuing getting together mm -hmm. in person. It's yeah. and real and realizing how important that is and how special that is and how irreplaceable that is. And so making these adjustments is actually a very smart um, move, you know, mm -hmm. and it's very, it's unconscious and, and it's just exciting for someone like me because it actually creates belonging. Um, but it has to be done intentionally. Wow. That's amazing, Denise. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank we, you. there are so many, I was taking notes, like I was writing like notes down and everything <laughs> while you were talking. <laughs> um, but this has been a phenomenal conversation. I mean, like all of it, like the film, the work that you're doing now, how you're taking like all of the things that you've been on, you know, and have gone through along your journey is all leading you to this work and teaching people how, teaching people about belonging, teaching people how to build, you know, better businesses that have belonging at the forefront, um, mm -hmm. teaching people how to just kind of interact with each other with belonging at the forefront. And this is just, I mean, it's, it's part of what's going to create a movement, you know, and, and change society, change the world. So um, Thank wow. You. This is, this has been amazing. Um, so I got, I have three questions for you, just fun, fun questions before we wrap up here. And thank you again so much for spending time with us. Um, of course. like I know that my podcast editor and my integrator are going to be like eating up this interview. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my gosh, we need to pull this quote. We need to pull this snippet. And so oh, it's gonna be, that's awesome. Yeah, it's going to be oh, awesome. Be so, awesome. So I have three questions for you. So number one, yeah. how, how did you meet Kevin? Match.com. Oh, really? And that, here's the, the story is, is that um, some, he was living in Oklahoma 
I was living here in Denver. Someone wrote to him from Denver and I don't know, invited him to connect with her. And, uh, and he said, sorry, I don't live in Denver and uh, I live in Oklahoma. And then what happened at the time and match.com is like what happens when you buy books on Amazon now, which is if you like this book, you'll love these 10 books. So match.com had that feature too. If you like her, oh my gosh, you're responding to her. Well, look at all of these profiles. You would love these women. And so my picture came up and then he promptly got into a relationship. He wrote me immediately and said, hey, introduced himself. And then a few months later we met in person. And then a few months after that, he moved here. Wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> what is something that something super interesting that about you that most people probably don't know? Oh God. I don't know. What do you think that it could be? <laughs> oh, um, okay. I know. I don't you know. It's super sing. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is. And so this is what's crazy. Uh, and you don't know this. And I'm going to tell you this right now. So I have this big speaking engagement um, coming up. And uh, I've had this idea. Um, oh, maybe I shouldn't say it because it's going to be a surprise that day. But uh, I'll tell you when we're not recording. Okay. But uh, the thing that people, most people don't know about me, but anyone who's very, very close, which is actually like a small group of people know that my absolute favorite thing to do is uh, karaoke or a sing-along. I take guitar mm -hmm. lessons. I love, there, to me, the best night in the world involves some kind of instrument and, and a sing-along. That There's nothing better than that. And it's funny because to me, that moment creates belonging. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. Last, last question. What are you most grateful for? Oh, wow. Um, so that's going to make me cry. I mean, aside from like my beautiful, beautiful children and the relationship I have with my husband, I'm most grateful, I would say professionally, for making that decision that I made that day that come hell or high water, I would do this. And that I would just ditch my concern of how. And that I would just listen to the that call that I felt like I continued to get um, mm. because it's given me like my favorite, my favorite life. Right. Right now. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I love and that. Also, it, it brought me to you. It, it has checked off so many boxes. Like it's brought me some, you know, just amazing, amazing human beings in my life. Like you, um, it's given me the ability to express and create so many cool things and like centered me in a, in a life purpose, you know, which I mm. think is just such a gift. Wow. That's awesome. I know you and I met at a, uh, I always call it a mastermind. I'm just going to continue to call it a mastermind. <laughs> Whatever it really was. <laughs> and then I drug you along to the second mastermind. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so Denise, again, Thank you so very much for joining us. Um, it is an honor to have you on the podcast and I'm going to have you back because I want, I want, awesome. you know, as you work, as you go through your belonging work, I want to hear more about it. And I want um, my audience to hear more about it because I think it's so key and crucial for people to understand this and to really put it into practice. So I look forward to having you back on the podcast again, but I love you. The world loves oh, love you, you and you are changing <laughs> the world. And I am so glad to be on this journey with you. I mean, it has been a wild and crazy ride and there is nobody that I would want it on the, on their, on the train with me, but you. <laughs> oh, I love that. And I feel the same way, Teresa. Thanks so much. Um, and anyone who's listening, if you want to see how all of this started, just go to my website, projectenya.com and you'll find it right there. You can watch it. Perfect. And where else can, where are you on social media if people want to find you? If people want to, if they're on Instagram, you can find me on at Project Enye on Instagram. And that's E-N-Y-E. -E. And uh, I spent a lot of time on Instagram, spent a lot of time on LinkedIn. And on LinkedIn, you can find me at Denise Soler Cox. Uh, and, you know, you can connect with me there. I'm trying to think of like other places. Those are the two best places to connect with me at this awesome. point. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. And make sure that you, for anybody who is listening and watching, make sure that you stay tuned, follow Denise. Um, she's got 
amazing, like really fun posts and content that she puts out there, but definitely watch out for her upcoming movie and her upcoming book and some announcements about that as it gets closer. So thank you again for joining me for this episode. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. And thank you again, Denise. I love you. Oh, and I love you thank too. you for joining us. Awesome. Let's stay on so I can talk to you a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. How do we do that? <laughs>